I had the occasion uh, three or four weeks ago, uh, two occasions actually, to address the question whether or not the first year of the Obama administration had been a failure. And I took the opposite view that the conventional wisdom, wisdom would uh, contend. Uh, one was when Governor Kane was here and he spoke to a group, and as politicians usually are, he was 15 minutes late, so I had to do a song and dance for 15 minutes. The other was a debate at the University of London where it was being debated, resolved that the first year of the Obama administration was a failure. But I, I urged those in the audience that night to look beyond the headlines, especially in this day of 24-7 news channels who realize that the public's attention, particularly for political news, is limited. A news media that focuses on one story repeatedly, repeated time and time again over the course <coughs> of the day, at the cost of the larger, more complicated, um, more nuanced uh, context and the larger picture. It's true that the administration had come under uh, criticism from left and right, uh, and there's no denying that the past few months had been rather difficult for Democrats. Uh, the failure at that point to pass the health care bill, uh, the Massachusetts election, the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United, which seemed to, uh, at first blush, to foretend a, uh, foretell a um, uh, rush of corporate cash into American elections. But if all one relied upon were the headlines of the day and the mind-numbing repetitions of one or two stories on the 24-7 news media, uh, that's exactly what you would have concluded. You might well have concluded that the first year was a failure and that the future looked rather grim for the loss of the Senate seat in Massachusetts. But in the words of the old Gershwin song from Porgy and Bess, I said, it ain't necessarily so. And it ain't necessarily so, and let me tell you why. First year of failure? I hardly think so. The effort to ha pass the health care bill up to that point and the failure to do so up to that point, so overshadowed all other stories that it's understandable that the public might overlook the accomplishments of the first year of the administration. But scholars take a somewhat different view. Norm Ornstein, who is not necessarily a Democratic supporter, he's a resident <laughs> scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, commented in January that this Congress is on the way to being the most productive since the 1960s. This is before the passage of the health care bill. And Obama, despite a failure thus far to pass health care, <coughs> has had the most legislative success of any modern president, including Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton. We forget what the stimulus package did. The world was on the abyss of economic collapse. We are no longer. It's no small task, that. But even more, because of the worries about going over the abyss were so great and because that, uh, that was the focus of the debate, we forget that embedded in the stimulus bill were legislative provisions that had languished for years uh, on the progressive wish list. There was included a, a, a significant tax cut, one of the largest in the country's history. Ronald Reagan's remembered for his tax-cutting bills, but no one ever comments on the stimulus bill that it had that for the middle class and the working class to rebalance some of the dis fortunate gains that had been made by those at the top of the income spectrum under the Bush years. The remaking of uh, much of the educational system, the uh, enough legislative initi initiatives to alone make this one of the most productive Congresses in our lifetime. And Norm Ornstein is not the only one who took that position. Others, Alan Blinder, for example, the economist at Princeton, who used to be the vice chair of, of the Federal Reserve, uh, and others can be quoted to that effect as well. The future grim? Not necessarily so. This was, again, before the passage of the health care bill. With all the talk about the loss of the 60th vote in, in the Massachusetts election, and with all the understandable shock that that defeat engendered, we overlooked the fact that what happened was that the Democrats went from having the largest majority in the Senate in over four decades, 60, to having the second largest majority in the Senate in over four decades, 59. The task of meeting further legislative challenges, cap and trade, energy security, financial regulation, immigration reform, progress in the Middle East, uh, those tasks are made more difficult by the sheer solidity of Republican opposition, to be sure. And just to make one little point that points that up, there were 139 filibusters. You don't have to stand up and filibuster the way you used to. You just put a hold on something. 139 instances in this past year in the Senate. That's more than the whole decade of the 1960s, the decade of civil rights legislation and of Vietnam.